Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of 2024 of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Our first item of business is a decision to take item three in private. Are members content to do so? And we previously agreed to take item four in private. Um, so our next item of business is an evidence session with the Scottish Tourism and Hospitality uh, Bodies following publication of the Scottish Government's draft budget in December 23. I welcome Mark Crossall, Chief Executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, uh, Leon Thompson, Executive Director, UK Hospitality, and Colin Wilkinson, Managing Director, Scottish Licensed Trade Association. Um, thank you all for attending um, this morning and for the briefings uh, that we received in advance. Um, can I maybe start by asking, I mean, you know, you can point to, I know they've got criticism of the budget, but you can point to positive reports of the sector. We have seen um, a growth in uh, the economic value of the sector. Uh, we, you know, yourself, you recognise that there's an increase in um, visitor numbers, particularly international visitors. Uh, with that, we're seeing an increase in terms of economic contribution of the sector. Um, so you can point to positive um, you know, growth and recovery that we can see in the sector. So why is there so much concern about the budget and why is there a need for the calls for government support so strong? Um, I don't know if it... Now, there will be a chance to cover all the areas that you've raised this morning, so please don't feel the need to explain everything in, in the first answer, but if you maybe give us... Um, <laughs> Leon, if you want to go first. So uh, yes. there seems to be a contradiction between the sector. You can point to figures that show the sector is doing well, uh, that there's buoyancy there, but why is there such a need for government support? Yes, yeah, so, you know, the, the sector is on track to recover from the pandemic. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the issue that we have is that whilst venues may be busy, uh, the costs have just gone through the roof. Um, so whilst turnover is high, uh, there's little profit for those businesses that are making any kind of profit at all. Other businesses are si simply at a standstill situation and others are, are making a loss. Uh, we've seen uh, inflation increase. Uh, we've got interest rates which have been rising. Um, food and drink costs for our businesses when they're buying in product is up around about 20%. We've been hit with uh, wage increases as well, which is um, you know, all good because businesses want to pay their, uh, their workforce more money. Um, but those increases are being driven because of um, disruption in the, the labour market and uh, particularly around shortages and particular shortages in, in skilled roles, particularly chefs. Energy bills. Um, have been you know, exorbitant and remain incredibly high for businesses. There's a lot of focus on household energy costs, uh, which are high, but at least there is a cap in place there. There's no cap in place for businesses. So a lot of our members are paying 40, 50, 60 per cent more on their energy bills um, than, than previously. And really, there doesn't seem to be sort of um, any end in sight um, to that. So. Everything is up in terms in terms of the costs. Uh, so even venues which are which are busy are struggling to uh, to make uh, to make ends meet. The other side of this as well is that we are starting to see um, consumer confidence, which was already quite fragile. We're seeing that continue to soften even further and members are reporting that uh, when people are out in bars and restaurants they're not spending quite as much as they were before people aren't staying out for the same length of time going home earlier that that kind of thing so it's uh, it's a very very tough environment for for businesses at the moment um, we uh, working with uh, a research partner uh, are looking at about sort of about the loss of about 350 businesses in hospitality businesses in Scotland in the first three quarters of last year. And as members will be aware, there's obviously a lot of media coverage around businesses which um, post Christmas trading are now um, sadly um, closing. And there are other businesses that are looking at reducing their hours um, and laying off staff as well in order to uh, try and make uh, make the balance sheet uh, work for them. And Colin, if I come to you and your members, uh, because other businesses are feeling these pressures, it's not just tourism and hospitality, everybody's increased energy costs and other. What is it unique to the sector that is leading to a, a fragile picture that Leon's described? Is there kind of, you know, unique factors that are making the environment tougher for um, hospitality? Well, 
I think, as, as Leon has said there, um, one of the biggest disappointments about the budget was that, in our view, the importance of the sector wasn't recognised by the Scottish Government in comparison to what Westminster see as an important sector uh, in England. The rates relief would have made a huge difference uh, to many of our members that are small independent operators. And it was, a, it was a bit of a... We thought there would be something, um, but, of course, that, that didn't happen. We're seeing business confidence for our members um, dropping about 67% are not optimistic for the future. Uh, we are currently carrying out one of our six monthly surveys and we've seen uh, 190 premises, pubs and bars closed since COVID and they're permanently closed. Uh, from the results we've seen so far in this survey, we could see another 130 closing in Scotland in 2024. So, you know, various things were being hit by legislation that's coming in as well, and businesses really need a break to try and recover from the current situation that they find themselves in. Into town centres um, last year, was it maybe the year before now? Um, and one of the you know solutions that we could see for town centres was needing a mixed economy. And tourism and hospitality were a key player in that. It can't just all be about retail. It needs to be a changed economy. Do you, you know, the picture you've described makes that harder to achieve, or you know that because so, really at that time you're looking at how can we change the use of a of a property so that. A, tour, a hospitality uh, business can move into that. How can we? But now we're seeing those closing. They're, they're creating the empty spaces as much as retailers. Yeah, so we, we, we've had this accolade that the, the hospitality industry and the licensed hospitality industry could be the saviour of the high streets. We're seeing what's happening when it comes to retail. Um, but there's no incentive to actually um, you know, open businesses up. We're seeing so much um, legislation coming through. We feel we're not being supported enough by government. And we've also got the, the issue of, and you know, one thing is the, the low emission zones. We've seen what's happened in Glasgow um, to the nighttime economy there. And we've got these other cities that will be uh, introducing these in the summer. So, you know, that puts a, a further burden on a business that's uh, wanting to open and operate in, in the city centres. Um, I've got members for the, I'm going to bring Mark in a sec, but I've got members who maybe have supplementaries to call in. Uh, Brian, did you want to come in? And... Thank you, Kavina. Thank you uh, for the panel. I was actually on that, that particular point there. It strikes me that the way that the way in, it's not so much the LEZ, it's the way in which the LEZ was introduced. What I'm hearing is, you know, the night for the nighttime economy, it's it's not just from, from clientele inability to get in and out of the city because uh, the public transport's not not available at that time of night. Uh, and taxis aren't available anymore. It's actually for the, the workers themselves struggling to get. It. I, mean, I just want to confirmation that that's that's the case. That you know workers actually can't get in and out of work at, at that uh, time of night. Yes. And we, of course, we want to make sure that you know they can get home safely. And if you don't have the facility of public transport um, or the ability to get into the city centre very easily, then um, that has an impact on, on our staff security in getting home. Uh, yeah, God, very much to um, Colin, I just wanted to ask you how much of the reduction in usage of, of, pub, of pubs is down to societal change, i.e. Um, there is a lot more home consumption. You've also got a situation where cost of living rises are coming in, so folk are going out less. You've got preloading because youngsters aren't they drinking as much, but when they do drink, they tend to be drinking at home before they go to the clubs and the pubs at night. So how much of the change you're talking about is relating to societal change? There's been a great deal in societal change, you know, f from COVID. I think we've all become very insular. Um, but pubs are very adaptable if they've got the help to do that. Um, we've gone through many crises uh, in my 40 years in the industry, um, and we've, we've managed to get through it. I can honestly say that our members feel this current situation is worse than COVID. At least with COVID, we had some kind of support. We had the furlough, um, we had you know rates relief, etc. We're getting nothing now, um, and that's really hitting hard on a lot of businesses. Can I can I just come back to you very quickly and say, in the Scottish Licence Trade News in January, you had an article that touched on a number of uh, people within the industry. In the Edrington groups was emphatic. The Scottish hospitality industry is robust and strong. 
Despite challenges, there is a resilient spirit across the sector, continued collaboration and innovation, and a commitment to commodity will undoubtedly contribute to the industry's strength and recovery. What was your, would you come back to what the Edgington Group come is saying? Come back to that. Is they're looking at the overall picture. We're looking at small independent licensed operators that we represent. Uh, we carry out these six monthly surveys. Unfortunately, the one that we're doing just now um, won't be ready until the end of this week. But one of the things that stood out for me was we asked a more direct question of are you considering uh, closure uh, or are you going to close? Uh, previously, I'd said that you're looking at cutting operating hours, etc. 3% um, of respondents have said that they are either closing or seriously considering closing. So that's why we, you know, we could lose another 130 pubs. So for our particular sector, um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. Okay, thanks. And Kevin Stewart, did you wish a supplementary to that? Um, please, uh, convener. And, you know, Colin uh, talked about being hit by legislation, and you've given the example of uh, the low emission zone in Glasgow. And it would be interesting, convener, to see um, the figures from the LEZ, particularly as we move forward in terms of change. Um, what other legislation, Colin, do you think uh, is having an impact? I think it's the legislation that's going to have an impact. What we've legislation? Gone, well, we've gone through the deposit return scheme, which I'm afraid to say was shambolic um, and really hit the industry who were doing their best to prepare for this. That's going to be back in the limelight in 2024. You've got a tourism, sorry, a tourism tax. I know it's a visitor levy, but it's basically a tourism tax that's going to put extra uh, burden on industry, not just for the costs, but actually operating <coughs> this. Um, you've got alcohol advertising restrictions. Now, I understand that's going to be uh, reduced in its scope than what we were expecting last year. So these kind of things don't help the industry that's uh, fighting for its survival, or our sector is fighting for its survival. So, uh, in, in many other parts of the world, tourism levies um, are there, uh, and they work, and they don't They've not had an impact in many of these places. Um, so again, uh, you know, what difference do you think a tourism levy uh, coming into play here uh, would be from you know tourism levies that exist uh, in other parts of the world, in Spain and Germany and uh, and across Europe, really? Well, other parts of the the world don't have 20% VAT when it comes to tourist spend in, in this country, and I mean we're also looking at. A, a tourist tax, which is going to be on top of that 20%. There's VAT on top of the tourism uh, tax, so it's a tax on a tax. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's another cost burden, not just for the industry, but uh, for consumers themselves. Have you got a spy over my shoulder in terms of my notes, I know, I know. Colin? Uh, we are going, we're going to come. I'll let Mr Stewart in later. He's no. going to ask me some questions around VAT. We'll come to that as a subject. I know it's something that the sector has raised. But just to finish the initial line of question, I'll come to uh, Mark around the financial status of the hospitality <coughs> and tourism sectors. Um, last year, the committee in its budget proposal asked for protection of the Visit Scotland budget um, and recognised its important role in helping attract uh, visitors and support the sector. Um, there is a proposed cut to that budget in this year's. And do you, you know, do you, uh, what concerns do you have around that? But as I said earlier, we've seen an increase in international passengers to Scotland. Um, we've seen an increase in their spend. It's actually the, name, the number of visits are slightly lower, but the spend is higher. Um, what impact or what concerns do you have around the Visit Scotland budget? Th th thanks, Convener. And obviously, just I'd, li I'd like to just pick up on a yeah. couple of the other sort of or add to the contributions my colleagues have made, and, and maybe pick up on some of the questions that have come back. Um, I think first and foremost, um, the frustrations and that the industry has more so right now is our ability to be able to compete in the future and actually present a product that is uh, really how they would want to present it. And so it, it, it presents real value for money. Uh, and where we are seeing right across the globe now, tourism is recovering very strongly um, across Europe. Um, it's pretty much returned to near pre-pandemic levels. Um, and again, in terms of the conditions around um, the sort of financial pieces and I'll pick up maybe a bit later on the, the visitor levy impacts is there. But this, this ability and frustration of not being able to invest because the profitability of the business is not uh, at the levels that it needs to be. And it's not just about investing in the actual asset and the experience, it's about investing in, in people and how can we retain those staff as well against a, a backdrop. But what, I got an email from um, 
a, 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 a private independent operator who is very successful or has been a, made a huge commitment to Scotland over recent years. They operate um, in the Highlands and also um, have businesses of different diversity, so brewing and to hotels and restaurants, etc. And it just came through randomly to me on, on, a, on Saturday. Um, but I think it, I'd like to read it out because I think it is very typical of many of the views and opinions of a lot of the people who operate in the sector. So if that's something, it's not a very long email, but it will give you a picture, I think, of some of the, the sentiment and the frustrations that sit around it. Um, I don't think I've ever known a harder time to operate a business in Scotland or seen a government destroying any hope for growth and the ability to come back from the years of Brexit, COVID, energy costs, interest rates, huge tax rises, cost of living crisis. In fact, it seems as though we're determined to squeeze money, any money left within the sector and ensure the final nails in the coffin are truly hammered in. Sadly, I feel as an independent operator, part of a dying breed, where the future will see global chains running hospitality in Scotland, as they will be the only ones left who can offset the costs of operating. I remain a very positive person with a solution-led approach to life, and I have, as I always have been in my professional life. And I have responsibility for hundreds of staff who all need to see a calm and positive working environment as they themselves are struggling with their own family circumstances and the state of the economy. Creating a positive working environment under these conditions is a daily challenge, requiring every bit of leadership and energy I have. For the past four years, I've had to be a social worker, a pastoral leader, financial advisor, and have offered more flexible working conditions before than I can ever think about when I've been operating a business. This includes ensuring we're paying all our staff real living wage, supporting those who can only work a few hours a week as this is not enough to live on so they require free meals before and after they start their shifts which we provide with training involving accessible communication managing difficult conversations mental health and well-being before training on skills needs for actual job people are doing we're literally sorting out the mental health and financial mess which uh, caused by decisions taken which lacks any business understanding and not because it's part of my role as an employer but because uh, it has somewhat far too many people are suffering and the cost I wake up every day pushing down fear and wondering what is coming today looking ahead with the tourism levy DRS high taxes all to prop up a failing economy yet we're still seen as a cash cow for government and councils not sure they understand or care uh, that this is not the case we are their answer to funding cuts and in infrastructure for a government that perhaps wants to see change we seem to be destroying independent operators instead of allowing the Scottish hospitality industry um, to really thrive and flourish. Despite these challenges, I will still address these issues and do everything I can to support my team, my families and the barriers around inclusion and sustainability. Anyway, rant over. Thank you for being our voice. I receive that, as I say, and it's not the first. It comes from many, from different people, um, all different types of businesses, owners, operators, large and small. We have huge ambition in here. We have obviously seen positive growth in international numbers. We're about to get some more results, I think, published today, which shows that. So as a country, we are uh, a destination of choice uh, and, and, and in demand. And I guess the other concern we have right now is that you can come but it's important that we're able to give them something to do. And if pubs and restaurants and those other businesses are shut, um, then actually that proposition becomes weakened against a very competitive uh, market that we're up against elsewhere in the world. Um, Gordon McDonald, did you wish a supplementary? And then I'm going to bring a in point of clarification on the email you ran out, uh, you read out there. Sorry, Mark. Um, I've, I was busy taking note of all the points she raised. And apart from the tourism levy, which is Scottish Government responsibility if it's introduced and if councils decide to take it up, you mentioned energy prices, high interest rates, cost of living, economy, social security, all within the remit of the UK Government. So who was it actually the, the email pointed at? Was it at the UK Government or in general or what was the situation? It's, uh, it's a general piece and I think what we've always, all of us have been saying in the, around the discussions around business is that it's the cumulative impacts of, of everything that's happening at the moment that has actually put pressure on and actually we need the stimulus to enable that economic growth to happen and actually the conditions for success for business which is a lower level of VAT it is um, not having any extra burden of tax put on us or, or, or framework that sits around it that won't uh, that prevents I guess those businesses for having the confidence to invest uh, and and you know again I come back to this competing uh, concern around 
prices having to be pushed up to combat inflation. And actually, when you are now commanding a, a price point for a, a meal or a, or a hotel stay or otherwise, it's perhaps a bit uncomfortable even for the owner and operator to charge that. And there is choice out there. Um, and as a consumer, of course, we're all more and more conscious of how much we will have available to spend when we go out and, and, and it's not just overnight stays. And when you go out and you're asked to pay a bit more, you expect the quality to be a bit better and actually the service standard to be better. So it's the, com it's the compound impact. And the worry is, is that, you know, looking forward, there are levies and obviously there are other, there's other uh, legislation under discussion still and whether that is alcohol advertising deposit. These are all going to be cost to businesses at the end of the day. So, you know, it's, it's building and building and the industry like this particular owner who have invested millions so far um, also you know shouldering the responsibility rightly so because they want to about the care uh, of their local um, of their people but also about the community as well that they support and contribute to thank you uh, just before i bring in Myrtle fraser the question about visit scotland and the budgets and you talked about competition and i think last time we looked at this we looked at the example of ireland and the investment that they made um, they have you know there's a similar there's, there's a relationship there between scotland and ireland in terms of our, our tourism offer um, do you know where the visit scotland uh, budget where that kind of sits in comparison to how much other countries are putting into um, uh, by direct budgets? comparison i, I can't uh, give you 100 100 definity on that but i mean to the point around the visit scotland budget being uh, obviously sliced i know for a fact that there will need to be some changes to the core activity that they are have been able to do um, the rural infrastructure fund in particular was is one that obviously is a, a big chunk off uh, where, where there are investments that are being made to support that infrastructure piece but in terms of core marketing and international competitive and, and creating that awareness i know that will be a, a slide down the irish uh, the irish government have actually now lifted their levels of vat slightly um, but when you look at the, um, the evidence of, of what they are doing globally, uh, still is very, very prolific, even though Dublin Airport is actually at capacity of 40 million passengers going through it every year, um, they're still not holding back and they send out huge delegations to the likes of the golf community and golf shows as well. So um, my counterpart there, who I keep in close contact with, um, has still got his frustrations as well, um, but they are still very much a, a competitive uh, destination. And it's not just Ireland we should be looking at, we should be looking at other European destinations as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Myrtle Fraser to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I've got some questions around uh, what the Scottish Government is doing in its budget. But before I come to that, just as a follow-up to the, the previous discussion, uh, Mark, you were, you were mentioning some of the uh, UK-wide pressures on the industry, that so you know, VAT, interest rates, energy costs. But what I'm interested in, is there, is there a specific Scottish angle to this that's different? So, to contextualise this, there was a press report I read at the weekend. Uh, I think it came from the Scottish Beer and Pub Association. Colin, your your your, your rival, your rival lobby lobby group. But according to figures they had, pubs in Scotland are closing at twice the rate of those in England. So, I appreciate there are issues UK wide that we've discussed, but are there specific Scottish issues that make the situation more difficult here? Any, any anyone who wants to pick that up. <coughs> Well, I'll go back to the, the, the rates relief that we were looking to, to have. You know, it's two years now we've not had that. I think that would have made a significant difference for our membership, um, being small independent operators. Um, so that's reflected in the fact that you know, we're, we are seeing pubs close twice, twice the rate than that of England. Uh, I would like to add, and it, it's not just about pub closures, it's the number of pubs that are not operating to their full operating hours. Uh, January, February this year, we see about f just over 50% of pubs will be operating uh, restricted hours. Um, many will be either five or four days a week um, because there's just not the business and the costs um, are, are forcing them to do that. So as Mark says, if you're having some sort of offering for people coming to Scotland, um, if it's January, February, you know, half the pubs will be, will be on restricted hours. Okay, so I'll bring Leon in a minute, but just to follow that up, um, you know, some of these issues are not just restricted to Scotland or the UK. So I had a meeting with the German Consul General just before Christmas, and she said, you know, in Berlin, a lot of the restaurants are shut now two or three days a week because they can't get the staff. So, so there are issues 
that go beyond. But what I'm really trying to focus on is, are there specifically Scottish angles here? Leon. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean, Collins uh, touched on the, the issue of um, business rates, non-domestic rates, and that's certainly where our, our businesses are at a competitive disadvantage to, um, to those operating uh, in England. For example, our rates are, are generally higher um, for businesses here in Scotland versus businesses uh, operating in England. Uh, a lot of uh, my members are operating right across the UK, so obviously they're able to kind of tell me that, you know, there is a disparity um, between the between the costs um, of uh, of doing business in Scotland versus the uh, rest, of, uh, rest of, of the UK. Um, <clears throat> we had the revaluation in 2023. Um, I suppose we went into that process with hopes that we might see businesses uh, starting to get more reasonable uh, rateable values attached to, to their businesses. In most instances, we saw quite the opposite, uh, with businesses being charged, certainly in my, amongst my membership, you know, anything up to 25% more um, for their uh, for their business uh, for their business rates uh, than 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 before. We obviously have a, another revaluation coming in 2026. Now that we're on a sort of three yearly cycle, and you know businesses are re really concerned about how that's going to uh, play out, particularly with turnover being high, rents going up. You know they could be in for a, a, a really uh, a really big financial hit uh, on the next round of uh, of business rates as well. This is something that we need to address. We need to address the system, which is 170 years old. Um, is it fit for purpose? Is it actually delivering the invest, you know, the opportunities for investment and growth that we we need to see? So, I mean, that's a specific that's the specific Scotland angle to to this. Then we've obviously got the 75% rate relief which obviously wasn't passed on. Again, in speaking with our members, uh, they're looking at uh, being their. Uh, pubs in Scotland being disadvantaged to the tune of about £15,000 a year, uh, medium-sized hotels about £30,000 a year, and then for larger businesses who would get the, the cap, uh, that's £110,000 that they now don't have um, to spend on rising costs to uh, you know, ensure that the fabric of buildings is up to scratch so that it's absolutely bang on for, uh, for people who are coming in as guests and, and, and visiting. So uh, the particular Scottish angle is the, uh, is the issue around business rates. Mark? Yeah, and obviously you know, we've got fab bills and stuff that are all, you know, a lot of these businesses are sitting now, um, obviously with those in their in their disbursement box and we're hoping those reliefs etc would take some of that pressure off but i think leon's you know summarized it um very well so we've we, we it's that two years on the bounce where it's just not been um given that flex and it, again it comes back to that investment piece competition creating the right um sort of proposition and and to the point you know earlier around has there been a change i can't remember if it, if it was gordon or, or kevin who'd, sa who'd said the um has there been a change in behavior um businesses need to respond and they they have been very fleet foot i think in terms of changing their business models over time uh, particularly through covid most of them did but that all still comes at a cost and and the retention of staff is also a key one here so to trade to not trade seven days a week actually and only trade three actually your appeal to somebody who's looking for work becomes less as well if you can give them assurance that they have a longer guaranteed working number of hours that's fine but one of the other big impacts we're still seeing in towns and city centers in particular is there is still um you know a, a very different dynamic around people working uh, in city centers there are very very few people um, in those offices still, which don't then bring the vibrancy onto the, um, the streets and the pubs and things after close of office or lunchtime. Can, can I ask a, a specific follow-up around the business rates issue? Because you've all made the plea for the 75% business rates relief that applied south of the border to have been replicated in the Scottish budget. Now, the Fraser Valander Institute have said that, that actually would be relatively more expensive in Scotland because of the different structure of the industry here because there's a cap as I understand it that applies uh, above a certain level in England and because they have more larger businesses in England more people therefore uh, hit that cap and therefore wouldn't get the relief so um, I suppose I'm interested to get your reaction to that given that even if you took all the Barnet consequentials from that 
in the budget, it still wouldn't be enough to fund the full 75% relief for everybody in the sector. Leon. Well, I mean, there's, there's ways of, of managing this. I think one of the most disappointing things around the 75% uh, the rate relief was that there was no discussion. Uh, yeah. with, uh, with, with our sector about that. I mean, we all made representations to the Scottish Government about if this relief comes, then you know, we'd, we'd really like to see it passed on. Obviously, we'd like to see it passed on in full. Uh, if you look at um, how it's been managed in Wales, they've obviously gone for 40 per cent. That's not enough, but you know, the point is you know, there's a conversation to be had here, and I think if we're uh, having a serious um, dialogue between government and business, and we have a new deal for business um, relationship, if that is a genuine thing, then this is a sort of um, conversation that we should have been having, we should have been invited in to have with Deputy First Minister uh, Shona Robeson ahead of the budget to actually look at options and, and possibilities, rather than it just being a flat no. And, you know, it's, it's the money, as I've outlined, it's significant amounts of cash which make a diff will make a difference to business you know, will make a difference to business some businesses surviving um, some businesses being able to trade at something approaching an optimal level and for some businesses to perhaps put in a little bit of investment just to sort of keep their uh, their offer their offer fresh um, but you know it's the money and it's the um, I think the the lack of respect you know, for not actually coming to us and having the conversation about uh, about this, because this is the second year that it hasn't been passed on. So I think the Scottish Government knew what the reaction was going to be, um, you know, based on last time. So I feel it would have been a sensible approach to have actually invited us in for a conversation ahead of the budget. That didn't happen. OK, thank you. I mean, that's quite strong language, saying a lack of respect. Do you think the Scottish Government are just not listening to your concerns? You know, we, we're all engaged with, uh, with the Scottish Government. We are, we're all on lots of different meetings uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Tom Arthur, with uh, Richard Lockhead, uh, with Neil Gray. You know, there's a, you know, a lot of good dialogue there, but we needed a budget that actually backed up those words. And, you know, we, we just didn't get that. And the 75% rate relief issue is something which really rankles uh, with, with my members. Um, uh, disappointment, uh, anger. I mean, that is how businesses have, have viewed this. I, I, I think just going back, you know, that sort of chimes with the words of the member I wrote, I, I read out to some of those frustrations. And to Leon's point, uh, this is the first time we, we've never had any, any dialogue at all with a, a finance secretary um, pre, pre a budget. Um, it was almost, well, there was no visibility at all. Very much welcome the, the engagement with Neil Gray and, and Richard Lockhead, and we put submission papers in and they were well received. But given the significance of this, it's huge. So to then obviously you know, receive what is effectively only four million pounds, I say only four million pounds, four million pounds of very welcome support for the hospitality businesses in the island communities, that's a small sum. However, uh, when you look at the impacts that those businesses have had to take as a result of uh, ferry failure, it's it's barely due compensation for for loss. So, and 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 the, you know, it, it gets spoken often or referenced often around the small business bonus scheme, which is of course very welcome for many of the small businesses in our sector. But there are still 10,000 businesses in our sector that actually receive no benefit or no support at all. All right. Thank okay, you. Um, thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald, did you wish My a supplement? Uh, thank you. Uh, Colin Smith to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thanks, Kavina, and, and good morning to the panel. C can I follow on from uh, Murdo's question? And I mean, the, 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 the impact of the budget, uh, I know it was hugely deflating for many businesses in the south of Scotland, hospitality businesses were looking for that um, additional rates relief. Uh, and, and the concerns over that are obviously well documented. What maybe isn't as well documented, though, is the sort of wider issues around business rates that I know you have strong views on, Leon. You touched on this at the beginning when you said that um, the, the turnover has risen amongst a lot of businesses, um, and that's positive, but not to the same scale as costs have risen, energy costs, staff costs, everything else. Um, and so profit margins have fallen. Um, now, that obviously has a big impact on business rates, given the way that we calculate business rates for hospitality on the basis of turnover. So could you say a little bit more about what the sector is looking for in terms of the wider reform 
of business rates, given that, that these issues are around, around turnover? Well, I think, to put it quite simply, we're looking for a lower poundage rate for, uh, for hospitality businesses. I mean, that's, the, um, that's a model that could fix a lot of the issues pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I, th I think Colin certainly got some, you know, sort of ideas around that um, as well. But I mean, reducing the poundage for for our businesses would be would be a quick way of actually addressing the um, the problems that uh, that they have uh, with the, the charges on on business rates. So, so the, the, the idea of using turnover is still something that should continue if you, if you were well, to reduce the, I think, the I poundage. Suppose, I, su I, suppose, I suppose there's 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 kind of two approaches to this. We need we need something which can help quickly. So reducing the poundage is a is a good way of doing that. I think if uh, you know Scottish government uh, you know believes that uh, our sector tourism and hospitality is a growth sector, then you know how do you stimulate that? So, okay, you know reduce the poundage rates on the. Uh, on on, uh, on on business on business rates for hospitality businesses uh, going beyond that you know it is about sort of looking at how the the methodology currently works how that's run you know basing it on turnover is not helpful uh, basing it on uh, rent values again is not helpful because our businesses generally pay more for uh, for rent because of the nature of the businesses they gen gen generally need larger properties in order to have people come in and be comfortable in in their venues um, they obviously uh, you know spend money um, on those uh, venues as well which then sort of you know pushes up the rental values again as well so our businesses are, are caught with that so if we wanted to look at other options we could look at profitability um, we can look at uh, um, uh, uh, reductions if businesses are investing in net zero um, uh, uh, approaches to to running their businesses um, fair work if businesses are signing up to the principles of fair work how are they to be you know supported in that how do we use the business rate system to support uh, those businesses um, in doing that so there are a number of ways that we we can do this but uh, these things take time, so it's a bit like looking at, well, what could we achieve quite quickly? And reducing the poundage that is paid by hospitality is a quick way of actually getting us to uh, a more level playing field with other business types on the high street and also with competitors elsewhere within the, the UK, certainly. Very helpful. Uh, the convener won't let me carry out a full review of business rates at the moment, but Colin, you've got lots of ideas according to Leon about how we can change things. <laughs> Do you want to share um, some yeah, of them? Well, from the long, long term point of view, um, you know, we had the Barclay review what six, seven years ago, and here we are again. That you know, rates are still a huge issue. Um, they haven't been fixed. I'm particularly speaking on the licensed hospitality sector. Um, we've had an issue with commercial rates for decades because of the way we are rated. We were based on rental evidence, we are based on turnover. Um, nobody quite understands how they fully work out what the, the, the rateable values are, but it, it used to work out about 8.5% of your turnover was rates payable. That has slightly changed, you're between 6 and 10% at, at the current time, but that's still a very high percentage of your turnover you're paying in commercial rates compared to other sectors. So, along with the Scottish Beer and Pub Association, we had suggested, and I feel that we are quite justified to ask for a, a specific licensed hospitality um, rates poundage. Uh, the suggestion was 35 pence in the pound. And I say I think we're quite justified to ask for that simply because disproportionately we pay more than many other sectors in commercial rates. So, that would be a quick fix. Um, but as Leon says, you know, we, we have to get the commercial rates sorted out for all businesses because it, it's just not working now. It's a very interesting point because of the business across from my office who showed me his accounts, their turnover was going like that, profits were going like that, but business rates were going like that as well. Um, sorry for the record, that, that, was, a, that was an up, <laughs> up sign. You, you won't go and put that in the official record, but that was turnover was rising, uh, profit was going down, but business rates were, were, were rising, so it's clearly uh, um, something's wrong with the way we calculate it. I don't know, Mark, if there's anything you want to add to that around the sector. What I'm also keen to hear from, you mentioned earlier about 
you feel there's a lack of respect from government. The one chink of light in the budget may well have been a commitment to review uh, how we calculate um, business rates for hospitality. Have you been contacted by the government yet on that review? Do you know what the timescale is, given the, the urgency of the issue? Um, but uh, you may want to come back on that one. But I don't know, Mark, if there's anything you want to add or not. Other, other yeah, parts of the tourism I, I sector? I mean, other, obviously, the commitment's very welcome. And it's been, a, you know, it's one of the work streams in the New Deal for Business Group as well. So, you know, that is welcome. But I guess to Leon's point and Collins as well, we need pace. Um, you know, before we lose too many more businesses in that adjustment. But we also need to create the environment that attracts inward investment and more people to actually want to open up and bring new, new product uh, and new proposition to the marketplace. So I think you've got a meeting tomorrow, is that right, with um, Tom Arthur and um, Neil Gray and Shona Robson. So, you know, that's a start point. But it's 170-year-old, you know, modelling um, and... Um, Barclay Review six years ago, okay, we've COVID in between, but there has to be transition and there has to be quick. And, and when you're looking across the rest of Europe, you know, as an industry, this sector stimulates an awful lot of benefit for the local economies uh, and it can be a real economic driver. We've got a very sort of, I think, um, a backward model here that has to change. So, uh, but welcome the dialogue, which I think is important, but it's great words. It's about action now. So. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Beatty to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to explore another aspect of the Scottish Budget, which uh, has been raised. The Budget proposes that there will be a, a further divergence in income tax between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Now, submissions from STA and UK Hospitality argue this is making it harder to recruit and to retain talent. Is there any evidence on the extent to which this is actually impacting on businesses in tourism and hospitality. And maybe I can ask Mark if you would like to kick off on that. Uh, th thank you for the question. And I, I, yes, I mean, we've said this um, because we, we do have concern and we do know, and um, Leon's chair uh, of UK, who is who's chair of UK Hospitality Scotland, is the managing director of Crera Hotels. Um, and, you know, recruiting um, senior management um, we're now having to pay, you know, more than uh, the average uh, salary that would be offered elsewhere in the UK to compensate for the higher tax bans. Um, my own son um, is is uh, the resident manager of uh, Glen Eagles Townhouse here um, in Edinburgh at 32 years old. He's uh, very proud of him, very uh, successful young man. But there are a lot of young people of in his age, you know, his age bracket who are exceptional in what they do, emerging talent in Scotland, and I think there are also a lot of other opportunities elsewhere in the world for, for young people to go and uh, perhaps further their careers elsewhere. So the dangle of the carrot um, of do I pay more tax or do I go uh, and look at other options? Uh, are people likely to come and tap away um, that talent from Scotland, which we cannot afford to lose, is one that gives us concern. Um, the hard facts will be in the ability to recruit as well. And I think, you know, certainly speaking to Chris Wayne Wills, uh, when he said to me that, you know, those are the sort of inflated uh, salaries that he can obviously uh, have to weigh up whether he can afford it or not to attract that talent in because of the tax bans um, is something that perhaps puts us at a disadvantage. But, you know, the proof will be in the pudding and particularly, I think, over the next few uh, months to come of weighing it up. But it's a live conversation within the industry without question uh, in those, um, in, with, amongst the colleagues who, are, who fall into that new banding. I suppose in my own mind, I never think of the hospitality business as being particularly highly paid, certainly at most levels. <clears throat> You've mentioned about uh, senior management in hotels and so on f falling into the, that category that would be picked up by the increased taxes. What other areas might be affected? Well, we are attracting, I mean, we, we employ people in our businesses now who are not just your perhaps traditional hotel employees. We've got um, marketing experts, um, digital, digital experts, engineers, you know, different skill sets are right across the piece who, who are all needed to, you know, um, support uh, an industry that actually delivers the, the rounded tourism and hospitality experience. You, you, you look at the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, the Royal, Britannia, Royal Britannia, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to say that many people who are working in the hospitality sector now are earning 
uh, levels of uh, in that in that banding now because obviously costs uh, from the bottom up from uh, the, the real living wages you know escalated uh, right the way through the um, through the the the, uh, the the group of people uh, that are employed in a business but the skill sets um, accountants you know these are all individuals who are uh, essential to our industry as well. It's not just the, the frontline service staff that we're looking at here. Perhaps Leon might like to come in. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the wage rises, the salary rises that have been taking place and within hospitality, I mean, there are now sort of, you know, many sort of mid-ranking and certainly senior chefs who are now sort of in those upper, upper brackets for paying income tax. And this is where a lot of hospitality businesses are really struggling to, uh, to get those, uh, those, key, those key workers uh, coming in. So, um, you know, anecdotally, members are saying that, you know, this is, this is something which is cropping up in the sort of interview process and when people are actually looking for roles to take on roles, move into Scotland from elsewhere in the UK, this is something that they're asking about. So there's very much a sort of sentiment and perception piece in there. Uh, the, um, the, the facts are that uh, businesses uh, like the like Credit Hotels, as, as, uh, as Mark has um, highlighted, are having to pay uh, more in order to offset the, uh, the income tax uh, increases um, as well. I mean, it will take time to see sort of how this, how this works out. We'll obviously be able to assess that against our members. The Scottish Government will be able to look at uh, migration into Scotland from, uh, from other parts of the UK to see how that's been impacted by uh, uh, divergence in, in income tax as well. But it's, uh, it all also plays into the narrative of Scotland being a, a more expensive place to do business. You know, we're looking at um, large hotel groups who are looking to invest. Um, you know, Scotland's on their list. You know, the th you know, Scotland's a great place. You know, people want to come here, but questions are asked about uh, is it a good place to do business with all these costs and you know will there be any change to that uh, in in the future so so it's it's an important point um, because it's something that we need to actually understand more on in terms of you know what the what the impact uh, of that of that is um, Mark's also talked about professional services that uh, our businesses use as well and we know that other um, parts of the economy are saying that um, you know it's proving difficult to get those uh, professional people to to move to Scotland um, because of uh, the uh, the higher uh, in, uh, higher rates of, of income tax so it, it will be one that we'll have to watch and see how it plays out over over time but uh, it's um, it is uh, being raised by members uh, fairly uh, consistently at the moment. I guess the difficulty is that <clears throat> most of the evidence we're receiving is anecdotal rather than, you know, hard facts that we can say, right, this is what happened then and so on. Are you going to be gathering that sort of information? Yeah. Pull that in from, from our members. Um, so that mm -hmm. can be played into the into the mix um, but I think it would also be helpful to actually see figures from Scottish Government I'm not sure if they're available or not on uh, you know how it has assessed the uh, the impact of of this policy possibly the Scottish Government would benefit from getting input from business on this absolutely feedback, which means there has to be hard facts examples uh, which would help uh, support that narrative is it is that what you're aiming for. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's that's something that we can we can add into the survey work that we do with our members, um, and uh, if, you know, have those with our conversations with our our board and our council as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Stewart, be followed by Evelyn. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, thanks to the panel for joining us this morning. Um, we've spent a lot of time on business rates this morning, um, and I have to say that uh, I obviously uh, get folk at me about uh, business rates, but not as many folk, and you could probably name the folk actually, but in terms of your members, um, but not as many folk um, on about that as certain other things. Um, you mentioned high energy prices in terms of the conversations that I've had uh, over the last year, 18 months, Energy prices has been way up there in terms of uh, the additional business costs, um, and you know you may want to make comment on that. But the other uh, thing which uh, comes up again and again and again um, is VAT, 
Um, and obviously, um, there were some changes during the course of the pandemic, uh, which were beneficial. But again, there are some structural things that have remained the same for a long while. Um, for example, um, the FSB the other week uh, called on the UK government to upl uplift the VAT threshold uh, by inflation, which hasn't happened since 2017. Um, there have been calls from others in the industry uh, around about different VAT rates for uh, hospitality, for uh, pubs and hotels. Um, what on that front would you do? Do you back the FSB's call uh, around about the threshold? What else would you do to change the VAT regime uh, to make it easier for your members? Sorry, um, we've been very clear, I think, unanimously in terms of uh, calling for a, a lowering of VAT for um, the hospitality sector, um, largely um, both to compete against other destinations, and you've, we've touched on the visitor levy earlier, and hopefully we'll have a bit more conversation about that as well. Um, I, I referenced our colleagues in Ireland, um, you know, 9% was the VAT level in, in Ireland, and they were trading at that level. Uh, and it, you know, there's evidence to show that it actually uh, delivered more for uh, returns, um, allowing that lower level of uh, VAT and the stimulus that it brought into the economy. Um, so our, um, our UK budget submission, and will come as no surprise as it always has been, is to call for a lowering of VAT again. Um, and we also think a lowering of VAT at a, at a national level, good for the consumer too. So. Um, that VAT campaign, campaign at the moment is calling for VAT at 10%, um, which, um, again, by comparison to other UK compete, or our European competing destinations, is more favourable. As far as the, the, the VAT threshold as well, I mean, uh, £85,000 is a, is a low level at the moment, um, and we're certainly concerned, uh, or what we see across Scotland and many of, uh, particularly in rural parts, is a lot of the, uh, the businesses obviously electing not to trade above that level, uh, and that then removes um, the, um, the product offer. Um, with a levy, um, obviously, should it be introduced by a local authority, um, that sum of money would then be treated as revenue, uh, and obviously then lift the, uh, that business um, quicker to that, that level, uh, and potentially reduce the capacity. So we would expect and hope that we would see a, a lift, you know, calling for a, a rise in that threshold to, to create more year-round offering and more year-round opportunity. Um, so very much um, a strong ask and will continue to be so, and I think we have a collective voice across um, all parts of the industry. It's not just a, uh, coming from a, a select few across Scotland or otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the issue of um, VAT is key point, which is continually raised with, uh, with the Treasury. Uh, with the Chancellor, um, with, the, with the Prime Minister. This is something that we, we need to get down. We're trading at uh, a huge disadvantage, uh, having 20% VAT on, uh, on hospitality. Um, when we had the uh, reductions um, during, uh, during COVID, I mean, they were incredibly welcome. Um, they helped our businesses a lot um, while they were able to, while they were open and, and it, able to trade, um, about 70% of hospitality businesses actually passed that VAT saving on to their customers as well, so stimulated uh, more demand, more spend, and obviously helped, um, helped customers at uh, what was quite a difficult time as well. Um, so there are, I think there are sort of cre uh, clear parallels with the situation that our businesses find themselves in now, and a, a VAT reduction would help businesses get over the many hurdles which are in front of them at the moment. But in the medium term, it's also key to unlocking growth and investment opportunities. It's the thing that's holding, uh, holding uh, many businesses back as well. Um, and obviously, if we had VAT reduced as a destination, as Mark has said, we would become much more competitive, which would you know, increase the appeal. We'd be able to bring more uh, visitors um, here to stay in our, our accommodation, use our, our pubs, bars, restaurants, and, uh, and so on. So that, that, that is a critical point, and that's an ask uh, within the UK hospitality um, uh, 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 budget manifesto um, for the 6th of, 6th of March uh, to have that, um, uh, 
uh, that reduction in put in place uh, for for our businesses. Uh, on the point about th thresholds, Mark's really answered that. I mean, we've got a situation at the moment where the threshold is certainly holding back growth, um, and uh, you know businesses could be could be trading more, um, and that's that's not helping um, certainly certainly our destinations. Nothing much more to add to what's already been said, but you mentioned here about other issues that you've heard um, you know, businesses uh, or, or, or businesses have. Um, since just before COVID, if you look at all the costs of running a business in our sector, so we're talking about you know drink, food, wages, utilities. It, by the end of this year, we reckon it's going to be a 43% increase in running costs. So anything that would help of that reduction. Um, would certainly, you know, help to combat these increases that, we, that we've seen, and we can't pass them on. Um, so it would, it would help businesses if we got something resolved very quickly when it comes to VAT. In terms of that um, that threshold and folk, you know, choosing not to trade up beyond the 85k. Have you any idea uh, amongst you how many businesses that you represent are falling into that bracket? I don't have a definitive number, but many would be in the sort of um, self, uh, bed and breakfast guest house sector, as you as you probably appreciate. And I think the other thing is uh, that we need to also what, what we're told to to lift yourself above as well to actually deliver and grow your revenue accordingly. You then start to get into the realms of employing people too. So it needs to be a meaningful adjustment because you can obviously stimulate uh, and create jobs, but actually that balance is there. So. Um, and I guess the, 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 a, a monitor is to when you, you just look across the highlands and islands and see how many people choose to shut their door at the 31st of October or immediately after that half-term window. And there are a lot, and yet um, we genuinely think that there is, there is demand and there, we can create demand for year-round or certainly um, 10 months, if not longer, periods of trade because for a whole heap of reasons, people will choose to, you know, see different opportunities and different um, levels of price point as well. So, And actually blended travel now is another area where people are choosing to go and perhaps stay um, away from their normal place of uh, domicile uh, in, the in, in, in rural parts and work and, and enjoy leisure at the same time. So opportunities exist, um, but uh, in terms of numbers, the FSB have probably got a, a, a handle on it. It goes back to the, the question around surveying and inviting these key questions from our members. Collectively, we do that. One of the New Deal for Business group work streams is about harvesting insights and data and actually making sure we're asking the right questions that are able to provide you know, the, the intelligence we need to react positively. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, I have three members left who wish to ask questions, so we'll make some progress. Uh, so Evelyn Tweed, followed by Maggie Chapman. Thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. It's good to see you here today. The committee is obviously aware of the labour market and skills challenges facing the sector. Um, can you provide the committee with an update on where you see things at the present time and what needs to be done in the medium and long term? And maybe to Leon first. Sure, thanks. Um, the labour market is still incredibly tight. We just do not have enough people um, in Scotland to do the jobs which are which are out there. Um, linked to that, there are skills shortages as well. So even where people are available to work, they don't necessarily have the uh, the full skill set that uh, that our businesses are, are looking at. Um, we've still got about. 55% of our members in Scotland saying that staff shortages are an issue for them and within that there's the skills issue uh, as well. Uh, overall we're still looking at somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000 vacancies, shortages in the sector. What I would say is that uh, many businesses have just had to adapt and just accepting the fact that they won't get the um, uh, the workforce that they need to be able to trade in the way that they'd like to and to provide the um, uh, the, the the business um, that uh, that they would uh, that they would like to um, but uh, you know businesses are working incredibly hard uh, to recruit uh, talent and to hold on to talent as well um, many businesses as we've talked about are, are 
but not, are offering much more flexibility. Uh, we've seen pay rise. ONS estimates that uh, pay across the sector as an average is up by 7%. Um, many positions will be uh, attracting much higher rates of, uh, of um, uh, uh, increased pay than, than that uh, as well. Um, so businesses are, are working hard to, to do what they what they can. Um, we at UK Hospitality and, and other trade bodies a bit are involved with something called Hospitality Rising, which is a, an industry-led initiative to encourage more young people to uh, come into the industry and to consider careers in the industry. And that um, has been running for a, a 18 months, couple of years now. You know, good results, and it's uh, you know it's been brought in as a or has uh, began as a direct response to the uh, the shortages that we were seeing um, in our businesses um, uh, post uh, post pandemic and uh, and obviously with uh, the loss of um, uh, access to EU workers as well uh, through through brexit so that's that's obviously ha had an impact and continues to uh, to have a, an impact as well so uh, so businesses are doing everything that they can they're sort of you know reaching out to uh, uh, you know very uh, much more diverse um, uh, range of, uh, of population as well um, to bring people in and get people thinking about uh, jobs and careers in the sector. Pay is up, conditions have, have improved. Um, businesses are working hard to, uh, to plug those gaps um, that, uh, that they have, but uh, it remains uh, particularly tough and challenging. Um, bringing in skilled workers from overseas is something which is becoming, uh, has been difficult for, for most businesses, but the changes which are coming in place from, uh, from April this, uh, this year uh, with the new immigration um, salary list and the increase in the um, uh, the salary from 26,200 to 38,700 is going to put that route beyond uh, the vast majority of, of businesses. So um, this then is also another reason why it's uh, important that we can attract in talent from the rest of the UK as well into, into our businesses here. So, uh, you know, businesses are spending a lot of time um, on the on the HR side of things um, and uh, uh, you know working hard to uh, to retain uh, the the good workers that uh, that they've got yeah no I mean I, th I think as obviously Leon talked about the, the sort of 25,000 figure at the moment I think what we need to be mindful of is that by 2036 or tw uh, sorry 2026 we're going to need 40,000 um, you know how because you'll have to uh, accommodate churn um, and you know changing the perception of the industry is something that the, the industry has been working very hard uh, both in terms of its obviously pay and reward which is great I think we are the sector that's got the biggest accelerant towards the, uh, the real living wage payers than any other sector at the moment okay we're still a bit behind Behind, but you know, changes in a recent Royal Ascent around gratuities and all of these other things means that the actual industry is actually an attractive one to come and work in because it is actually pay and reward is not bad. Um, but also, um, it, it's more not just to the young people; um, it's more the, the wider ranging sort of age population, people choosing perhaps to have a second career, creating those variable or varying opportunities that exist. If you look in the attraction sector, historic houses, where a lot of volunteers and those types of um, opportunities that come about and it goes back to being able to trade and be open um, but importantly in uh, you know what I hope everybody and I know um, you know many of you have have met colleagues in the industry who work hard with the likes of hospitality industries trust Scotland springboard the industry are very committed to doing and helping young people and people of all age groups into work uh, and you know we have a lot of uh, other good initiatives to raise money to support the investment in um, upskilling uh, and hit Scotland this year it's its 30th anniversary uh, and the amount of money that you know is contributed by industry to then put the, that emerging talent through um, ex accelerated skills development across a whole wide range of, of skill sets is, 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 is something that we're certainly committed to but when you know, going back to you know the availability of, of, of offer, and the, you, you hear the inbound travel operators, tour operators frustrated because actually the property that they want to go to is actually closed for two days a week because they are protecting the staff level that they've got and therefore don't trade on a Monday or Tuesday. And that the knock-on impact of that is that stopping that travel trade uh, business placing business in Scotland when they know they've got demand and many of them are now telling us that it is difficult 
more and more difficult to do business in Scotland because of the breaks in the supply chain, and that's in the broader sense of, of the supply chain as well. So ongoing investment into apprenticeship model, uh, apprenticeship skills, and all of these things, we are, you know, very much um, hope that the, the the recognition that that investment is forthcoming into 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 the sector as well to grow it uh, and stabilise it and adapt. You know, but. Our industry is a people industry, uh, and we need people in the front line to have a conversation. And we can be very good with technology, but people want to engage with people, uh, whether that's a chef over a counter or a receptionist or, or otherwise. Yeah, I'd just like to, to add that staff availability has been a, a serious issue and continues to be um, for, for, for our, our sector. Um, Look at the results we've had recently, we're seeing about two-thirds of premises have had uh, issues about st staff and a third of the respondents to this survey we've carried out have actually had to reduce their operating hours solely because <coughs> that they don't have the staff to actually open the, their full operating hours. Uh, just an example, jumping back to, to pre-Christmas, um, I had never heard of um, pubs and bars and restaurants that normally open on Christmas Day taking the decision that, again, because they couldn't guarantee if they would have staff, that they would actually open on Christmas Day, uh, something I've never heard before. So it is a huge issue. Um, and I think as a sector, you know, we, people are looking at their work-life balance um, because of the shift patterns we can offer. Um, you know, that, that helps people that are looking at um, perhaps working only so many hours a week. Um, and as Mark says, you know, we've improved the pay offer, uh, our terms and conditions. Um, and it is a good industry to work in, but uh, we continue to have continue to have problems with with getting staff. And just lastly, sorry, come housing. Transport, obviously, another big challenge for, for the sector um, of how do we create those you know, where, where people can stay, and we know the housing challenges is well documented. Uh, but to the point around uh, attraction, and uh, Leon touched on the Hospitality Rising campaign and changing perceptions of our, of our industry, um, there was a 23% increase of people looking to wanting to work in the industry for reasons of sociability. Um, and it wasn't uh, an issue around pay. They wanted to actually have that sociable interaction, so which is a positive. I think maybe just one, one final point, just to kind of, sort of bring it back to the budget. I mean, we saw the skills budget um, yeah. cut within the uh, in December uh, for, for this for this for this coming year, which again doesn't help our businesses. Um, so I think of of you know big concern is uh, the fact that the flexible workforce development fund is being removed, and a lot of hospitality businesses were able to make um, good use of that, engage with uh, local education providers and schools and so on with the help of, the help of this fund, bring people, you know, young people particularly into uh, into uh, to hospitality, and there were certainly a lot of businesses that uh, um, were really. Um, uh, banking on that continuing uh, to actually assist them uh, bringing more people into into the sector so it's disappointing that uh, we've seen that cut so you know I think what we've talked about is actually businesses you know taking a lot of this activity on themselves and perhaps what we're seeing is just not the kind of support there um, in the public realm that um, that businesses need one thing that I did want to touch on in my constituency I've got fourth Valley College it's got a great offering on hospitality and tourism courses. I had a good look at all the courses last night. I didn't actually know there was quite a, as good an offering as that. How important is that to your industry that we have ready-made courses? Maybe not as one of you touched on, just for young people, but for anyone that wants to come back into the sector. It's vitally important and it needs to respond to the needs of industry though, so keeping those courses relevant and fresh is important. So our National Tourism Skills Group, which um, many of us are represented on, is there to inform. We work with the academic sector, we've got you know, um, professors from uh, Napier University and, and representation from the college network on there. So responding to the needs of industry in the future is going to be key and making it accessible. I guess um, also though when you go back into high school education, actually it's how you present those opportunities in through the 
the uh, careers options uh, and uh, again there's uh, an awareness and understanding that's needed to be um, better presented around what hospitality actually is and what those career paths are and the opportunities. So the pathways there. Um, I'm not sure that we've had as strong a take up uh, or certainly we've seen slippage in, in some of the draw into those um, hospitality and tourism uh, career options through through academia through the, the next further education and I think you know that's potentially because people see this industry as being is it going to stay open is it going to be shut is there, is there you know a number of other factors that could influence decisions but business is obviously sitting there as a, a lot of the the university sector I think have drawn business as a sort of the, the staple and then they bolt the other sort of specialist areas on top of it Okay. Yes, is that? Uh, Maggie Chapman's coming in with a question about the workforce, and maybe some of the uh, points you want to make can be addressed to Maggie. Uh, yeah. Maggie, and then Brian Bottle. Th thanks very much, Claire. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, just following on, actually, from, from Evelyn's uh, line of questioning, I'm, I'm interested. You, you know, we've, we've, we've talked already this morning about lots of, lots of issues that do affect the workforce, do affect the attractiveness of, of the sectors that we, we're talking about. Um, payment of the living wage, uh, skills, training, immigration issues, housing, transport, all, all, all of these things. I'm, I'm wondering, Mark, Mark, you said, and, and in your submission to committee, there's, you, you've spoken about you know, making the sector more attractive, and you say you, the highest, uh, you've got the highest acceleration towards payment of the, living, uh, of the real living wage. I, I guess, given that both, sec both hospitality and tourism are some of the lowest paid, in fact, they are the lowest paid sectors in, in our economy. I, I, I'm just wondering whether that there needs to be a greater emphasis on, on pay and whether that, that is something that I would help with the, the shortages that, that you describe. I, I, I suppose part, there's a question within that. Are the shortages you describe across, across the board, across the, the different types of jobs, or are they focused in, in, their, in specific areas of, within, within the sector? So question around yeah. the, the real living wage because I think fr from my point of view that should be that shouldn't be something we aspire to that should be th th taken for granted yeah. I, I don't so. think anybody any good operator an aspirational operator in our industry uh, would have any issue about wanting to pay their employees more um, but as you've heard from us all this morning the balance of uh, trying to um, maintain high levels of business rate, energy costs, food inflation, from being an operator myself many years ago and seeing what is now paid as a percentage of total turnover, it's a, a big, big shift. And let's not forget, in addition to the pay, um, there are a number of other benefits that the individuals are getting, and that doesn't a lot, uh, nine times out of ten, doesn't get picked up. The the gratuity uh, model is quite, you know, a, a, a significant sum of money. The the meals, the accommodation, and all of this other stuff factors in as a very uh, attractive package to an employee. So. Um, but there is a limit to how much people can pay. And to pay more uh, and actually offset the other input costs means pushing the price point to the customer up. And we are already uh, a very, very expensive destination. We rank 140 out of 140 in the world in terms of taxation on, on, a, on a tourism and leisure experience. So applying yet more cost and passing that cost on to the, to the visitor or the customer, there's a tipping point. Um, and so um, it's positive uh, and I think when when you, the, the, the cohort of hospitality industry trust um, people out there, I think if you ask many, many people in our industry, do they think they get a good wage and have they got the opportunity to earn a good wage in this industry, I think you will find most of them say yes. And I speak, uh, again, as I say, from having a young man in the industry who's chosen to stay in this industry off his own back, who is with his um, peers, you know, happy to be in this industry because he sees the opportunity and the potential in the broader sense. And, and, and sorry, I, I asked too many questions in one. But the, the bit about uh, shortages um, are, are they across? You know, are they from the, the lowest paid all yeah, the way yeah. up? There, there are, uh, there are, I think there are specific skill set, skill air, skills areas. Leon touched on chefs. Uh, it's not a Scotland specific thing. It's a global issue. Yeah. Um, I, I guess we also have real concerns around the loss of language skills. Um, so when you look at guide, guiding and you know other areas in the tourism economy where we would like. Uh, people who have set skill sets who aren't with us anymore uh, and we're not obviously haven't got language being taught in, in schools as well uh, up to the level uh, that we would like um, 
housekeepers don't seem to be too much of a problem anymore because I think that's the flexibility that that particular job offers. And as Leon said earlier, you know, uh, how businesses have chosen to set up their, their rostering, uh, very few of them have a split shift where you come in at seven and you go home at 12 and you come back at six. They're much more balanced. And uh, across the rural parts of Scotland, though, where we've seen obviously depopulation happen, of course, that's where it becomes more, um, I suppose, uh, intense and, and, and challenging. And having spoken at a number of conferences over the, um, the autumn period, where you see, you know, those, that, that generation leaving to go to university and then perhaps not returning um, to their local communities as well to, to take up work in the industry. So, so geographically, it's rural areas. Geographically, that are it's probably most. more of a stretch, okay. but it's it's not limited to the uh, just your, the rural parts. It's, okay, it's a broad thanks. spread. Leon, did you want to come um, in? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, businesses are paying more; they're having to pay more anyway. Um, you know, good businesses have been um, you know very much on board with fair work principles. Uh, both Mark and I are on the hospitality inquiry, which is uh, being run by the the Fair Work Convention at the moment, and it's been very positive um, conversation. I mean, the 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 the. the the, the key will be to get to you know a point where we find the levers to actually um, assist businesses to pay um, real living wage and we've probably talked you know we've talked about those uh, those what those I think we've talked about what those levers are um, here here today um, uh, you know businesses have, are having to be much more um, flexible in their approach um, with uh, with the workforce in terms of hours and and flexibility um, there I mean all the all the uh, the, the points we've covered in fair work, effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment, respect. I mean, the operators that I'm talking to, uh, who are in within membership within UKH, they're all adhering to these um, to these principles. Um, some are accredited real living wage um, businesses. Um, obviously, everybody will have to pay more um, from from April in terms of the national living wage as well. Um, Marks talked about tips we've had it we now have a tipping act which takes effect from July this year which will ensure that uh, all tips gratuities are passed on to um, on to workers um, tips are a strategic advantage for hospitality because mm. you know it, it is another um, way that we can promote jobs and, and careers uh, within the sector as well and uh, I think with the tipping act that actually helps us um, to sort of you know ensuring that we've got that level playing field uh, on tips right across uh, across the across the sector so there's a lot of uh, very positive um, developments um, in this space uh, within within the sector and uh, I'm pretty certain that that is something which you know, will continue, and uh, we will, of course, have the report from the hospitality inquiry. Uh, I think some point later, later this spring, early summer, um, which uh, you know will hopefully sort of identify um, those levers uh, that can help business get to where they where they want to go, um, but will also kind of point the way for um, uh, for our governments, uh, particularly the Scottish government, to to assist uh, in achieving those ambitions. And Colin, do you want to? Yeah. Um, I think it's a very good industry to work in. I think it's a career progression. It can be very quick in our sector if you're good at the job. Um, um, as, as long as there's businesses left that people can to uh, buy into. Um, the one thing I, I would add about the the living wage, yes, of course we want to pay our staff, you know, as much as much as we can. But I think we have to reflect on, reflect on the fact that. It's an increase in cost for businesses, but you then have other staff who have perhaps a, a longer service record mm -hmm. or um, have more qualifications. Um, they're looking for their differential to be increased as well. So it's, uh, it is an issue for business, but yes, we do want to pay as much as we can. But you know, please don't forget, there's also increases for other staff that have been in the business longer. Okay, no, no, th th thanks for that. I uh, I suppose following on from that, and you, uh, Leon, you talked about the, the Fair Work Convention work that, that's going on that, that you're all uh, contributing to in, in different ways. How would you, uh, ca what, what, what's the sense, what's your sense of how industrial relations are across your, your sectors and, and your members? People is a key pillar of, of the National Tourism Strategy, Scotland mm -hmm. Outlook 2030. I co-chair the Tourism and Hospitality Industry Leadership Group with, with Richard Lockhead, and the makeup of that group includes um, the union representation, 
um, and we have um, Brian um, is on the Fair Work Group, and I think um, even quoting Brian not so long ago, actually, he's very encouraged by um, the dialogue and the conversations that we've been having as a as an industry. And this strategy again was was developed by the industry in recognition that some of the work streams that we needed to address are addressed. We know that there are still challenges out there in one or two parts, but overall I think our relationship, um, we're all, as I say, in the church together rather than um, you know, fighting against one another. It's important that that is. But we've never been a, a particularly um, unionized industry at all, um, but recognizing that fair work's important and how can we reposition the sector as the right industry to choose to work in as opposed to going to another industry is what we're all about. Okay, and, and my, my final question, if I can, I, I suppose it's joining the circle, because I, we, we, I think we're all guilty of this in some ways. We focus on one issue and don't necessarily see the connections. When you're talking about the, the geographical variations of, of skills or labour shortages, the, the challenges around languages being taught in schools, the challenges around rural housing, transport, all of those things, I suppose all of that requires public money and public investment too, and that comes from taxation. And, and so there's, there's a balance. You know, the, the, a lot of what we've heard this morning is about how taxes are too high. If we don't have those taxes, we don't have any of, of that, that public investment in, in education, in schools, in, in transport, in, in um, the, the kinds of things that actually support people to live where you need them to live, to work where you need them to work. I'm just wondering, are you involved in any, any conversations that do actually take that broader picture around... Our, our, our nation's e economy, rather than rather than sector specific, and 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 what the levers are that will would affect specific sectors. Thinking about how pulling those levers here actually affect the other things over here that would have indirect consequences sometimes, pretty far down the line. Yeah. So I mean, I think we've all been involved with NSET, the government's um, uh, economic strategy, and that tends to be the um, the kind of starting point for a lot of conversations with with ministers as well. So we're 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 kind of well plugged into that. I think a lot of the um, the issues that we've um, highlighted today and the challenges that we've highlighted today are not um, exclusive to uh, tourism or hospitality. If you think about housing and transport, I mean, any trade association in Scotland would would highlight like that similarly around the skills piece as well that's not something which is unique to us every every trade association i speak to is you know but looking to get, to get those things we need investment we need taxation yeah i, I think there's other there are other things maggie that are barriers in the way our yeah. planning system is awful um you know we have a, a shortage of planners and you know the the accelerant to to get planning through systems to you know to attract private investors to who might be quite happy to build accommodation for staff etc um there are a number of other areas that actually get in the way and they walk away uh, perhaps from putting you know private money on the table to do that um but as leon said you know um as a, as a collective business community, whether it's, you know, Homes for Scotland, the Chambers of Commerce, FSB, we're all very, very joined at the hip when it comes to understanding some of the, the challenges uh, and the balancing act that needs to be found. And nobody is, 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 you know, blind to the fact that the public purse is challenged. However, um, the levers and going back to what could really drive economic growth into some of the communities as well through perhaps some changes in, in how monies are spent um, could obviously you know provide the stimulus and returns that we would want. Yeah, and I was just going to come in just to answer that question and say, I mean, if we can, you know, our, um, our sector is all about growth and investment. That's where our businesses want to be. So if we can give them the kind of financial fiscal breaks that they need, then they can invest, they can grow, which, you know, can then sort of ensure that there's, you know, more tax take coming in to, uh, to, uh, to, to government to coffers to spend on the services that we, that we need and that we, that we all want to we'd see there. But, you know, it's always about getting that balance right. Um, and at the moment, I think our, our, well, I know that our businesses, you know, feel that they've got a lot of tax burdens on them and a lot of cost pressures on them uh, from, you know, uh, broader economic uh, issues, but also from regulation and le legislation as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank uh, thank you, Kavina. Just, just a couple of quick ones. Uh, uh, I think it was yourself, Lena, mentioned the, the Scottish Conference New Deal for Business. Uh, just how would you assess progress against those commitments at the moment? Uh, 
Um, well, look, I mean, we are we're engaging in good faith. Um, you know, we have very positive dialogue with uh, with ministers. I mean, you know, uh, you know, they, they listen to what we say, but you know, we're just not seeing the kind of actions that uh, that we need to see. I mean, that you know, that you know, we need to see that um, uh, that uh, real uh, uh, delivery for for our sector, and we, we we just haven't had that. And the budget was really the, sort of the first moment um, to see that coming through. Now we have the. Uh, uh, opportunity to reform business rates. We need to see, you know, where we where we can go with that. But uh, you know, as well as dialogue, there needs there needs to be action, and that um, that's been the frustration, the lack of action. I don't know if anybody else? I, I, I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, at the core group, I mean, there are other work streams that are happening uh, as a result of actions from the from the New Deal group. One of one of which is around uh, looking at, you know, how. Bereas are brought together, uh, the regulatory review group, uh, changing culture within the civil service itself in terms of understanding business and, you know, recent meetings which we've only been, you know, it, well, not only been, but we've been involved in in the last week or so. Um, there is clear demonstration from within the civil service that there is, you know, work in progress to make some changes here. And I think inviting that commentary in and to create that better landscape is good but it, it goes back to, to Leon's point it is about pace it's about delivery um, and you know there's an awful lot of time being invested by a lot of people in the business community um, I'm not saying on a voluntary basis many of us are paid to be part of that uh, as part of our job but we need to see that sort of you know it's a two-way thing and I think the other concern um, or the other balancing act is actually you know the Verity House agreement of course uh, is one thing and then the New Deal for Business agreements another and actually uh, there's possibly collisions at times of where um, what a business might feel is the right way to go actually doesn't necessarily side with what the commitments have been made to the Verity House agreement. Just for bringing the call, just 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 on that, I, I was actually going to ask around that. The, 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 you know what the contradictions might be between the Verity House Agreement and your business deal. I, I wonder if you could maybe explain. Well, I mean, there's there's obviously you know the 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 transient visitor levy discussion is a big one. Of course, it's a it's an it's an open up opportunity to hand over um, decisions to local authorities to make. Uh, make a choice on on how uh, they might choose to introduce a visitor levy if it's done. We we. From as you'll be aware from our conversations uh, as the organizer STA in the group, we really would like to see a lot more conditionality put around um, a bill if if it is going to happen then so it 's not just given as an open book to to allow an authority to do what they want with the money if it 's there for a purpose to be raised for a purpose to reinvest in the tourism proposition and the experience, then actually stick to that and don 't just accept that okay you know will let the, the local authority collect more tax uh, and do or, or collect another levy and do what they want with it. So, you know, there's a there's a balancing act here and at times we feel there's a there's a risk that it could just be on you go. It's not our problem. Call it, uh, just do uh, you say that uh, you know the new deal for business was very much welcomed. Uh, I think there was a you know certainly an issue that uh, from the business uh, community that the Scottish government was out of touch with the businesses, um, so we are you know, very pleased to see the new deal for business being announced. How far have we got from it? In our view, the test was, I don't wish to go on about it, is the 75% um, rates relief. That, that was really the first test. So I think the Scottish Government's got a, a, a huge uh, mountain to climb. Um, again, referring to this survey, 97% of hospitality businesses say that the government is out of touch with business. So that's a huge mountain to climb. Um, the quicker we get back on track, the better. But yes, all, all the trade bodies uh, will continue to participate. Um, but I have, I have heard of people saying, well, why are we actually part of this? If nothing's really going to be achieved, that will help us in the short term. OK. I think that could be enough. Um, thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of today's evidence session. Uh, thank you very much for the panel for giving us our time this morning. Uh, we now move into private session. <laughs>